we have our next um, speaker up. So the next session is about serverless machine learning 101 by Tanya and from Microsoft. Uh, Tanya, can you just come up on stream? Hi, Tanya, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you. OK, OK, awesome. So hi, and welcome to PyCon India 2020. And uh, we can get started with your talk. So for everybody who is new to Delhi Stage, we will have a 25-minute talk by Tanya, followed by a five minutes Q&A session. So please feel free to put your questions on hop in, and we will, uh, Tanya would be glad to answer those questions. Right? Does that work, Tanya? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you very much. OK, all the best. Thank you. So uh, thank you, everyone. And I am very, very happy to be joining uh, PyCon India. And I'm going to be giving a very brief demo um, on how you can use uh, Azure Functions or machine learning. Uh, sorry, Azure Functions with uh, machine learning libraries like TensorFlow, so you can serve uh, and deploy your models in um, a very seamless way. So let me share my screen. And you should be able to see that. Um, so as I've already been introduced, I'm a senior developer advocate at Microsoft, and I specialize in all things machine learning, data science, scientific computing. And something that I get asked a lot when I talk about serverless computing is because the name is very, very misleading. So a lot of folks. Uh, often get confused and they are not sure if the real thing is that there are no servers. Um, but yeah, there, there are servers. Uh, the, response, um, the only thing that it changes from a more traditional architecture or a more trans, a traditional uh, serving paradigm is that you are not responsible for the main uh, for the management or maintenance, meaning that you don't have to worry about the servers, uh, hardware being updated every so often, or the software being updated because your cloud provider takes care of all of the provisioning. Um, and in this case, uh, because we're talking about Microsoft Azure, Microsoft Azure takes care of all of this. There are still a few things that you have to take care of. Um, things like your, of course, your libraries, your code, um, and some security constraints and the security of whatever you're deploying as well as your environments. Um, but most of the infrastructure load is carried by whoever is provisioning your cloud service. And this opens a lot of opportunities because instead of you spending a lot of time dealing with stuff like Kubernetes, for example, if you need highly scalable elastic compute, uh, do you have much more time to focus on the code and focus on what you're developing rather than on the infrastructure? So this frees up a lot of uh, developer time. And Again, I've already mentioned that one of the main characteristics or one of the main advantages of serverless computing is that it's managed. But another super important thing and that can leave, uh, lead to very, very significant improvements is that it all operates on a pay-as-you-go model. So you only pay for what you use. Um, in more traditional paradigms where you have your uh, local servers or you maintain your own servers, you have you're paying for well you're paying for electricity maintenance you're paying for uh, different services whether you're using them or whether they're, you're using them to their max capacity or not. Uh, in serverless computing, you only pay for what you are actually using. So if you don't have customers or you are not sending requests uh, to your API then your function goes idle and you don't have to pay for that compute time. The time, as soon as somebody else uh, or another customer needs to access your function or your service, then this Azure function goes from an idle state to an active state and you can access the compute. 
And another major advantage is that it's highly scalable. Uh, it allows you to go from, um, I don't know, being able to serve one user to a, a, thousand, a few thousand users or 100 users uh, very easily. And you don't have to worry about, as I said before, uh, things like Kubernetes uh, and all of that. Especially, and this is especially important if you only have um, a small team, for example, or you are in a very small company, or really your scalability uh, demands only relate to one product or one service. And probably some of you will have heard, or I've mentioned before, uh, Azure Functions. And Azure Functions is our Microsoft offering for managed serverless. And one of the, well, our offering not only allows you to take advantage of serverless architecture, but as I mentioned before, we take care, or Microsoft Azure takes care of the software. Uh, it gives you tools and allows you to do monitoring in real time. In an, it's by default enabled to scaling up and down, and the hardware is maintained, updated, uh, and upgraded by, by Microsoft Azure. We'll also as you deploy your function, let's say that you are generating an API or an HTTP API endpoint to do your machine learning predictions. Um, once you've deployed that, you also we also take care of the house management. And within this uh, serverless approach, you in this case a developer or the data scientist or machine learner engineer ma machine learning engineer are respons responsible of course for the application code uh, developing the solution or your product making sure that everything works okay um, and again decide what services to integrate um, Azure function has a lot a lot of bindings. Um, so you can directly integrate your Azure functions with services like blob storage, email, email providers, databases. Um, you can start integrating it in a lot of workflows. And especially when I talk about databases, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, Azure hosted. You can hook up your Azure function to whatever uh, data warehouse or data uh, database that you are currently using, whatever that is, um, whether it's Postgres SQL or, or else. <laughs> so again, um, it seems that these terms can be easily confused. I've already talked about Azure functions, about serverless, why it's serverless, um, Azure functions, and you're going to find out that as I go in the demo, I'm also going to make reference to a function project or into a function itself. And these terms can be quite confusing. Um, so just let's focus again. Serverless is also called function as a service because um, it consists mostly of self-contained code snippets or self-contained code applications. And by self-contained, this means that you provide uh, the runtime environment or the requirements and dependencies. In this case, for Python, um, we bundle up a your requirement text file from which we create a virtual environment using your Python runtime environment of choice. It can be Python 3.6, 3.7, or 3.8. Um, we're currently working on support for 3.9. And you have your code, your runtime environment and dependencies, so that it, it all can be deployed as a SIP um, straight away. And it will be uh, directly servable on the cloud. And because of, of this approach of having self-contained code snippets or self-contained um, scripts, that unit is called a function and uh, that's, why the whole serverless approach is function is called functions as a service because it's readily deployable. 
Um, again, when we talk about serverless, there are a lot of things that are very, very interesting. And apart from all the characteristics that I mentioned before about scalability, pay as you go, uh, manage infrastructure, um, I also mentioned that they can be idle in time and you can trigger an event that will wake up, let's say, your, your function. And again, you can link to many, many different events. Um, for this demo, we're going to be creating a HTTP, a HTTP API. Um, so what is going to trigger a response or a, a function is going to be a post request to the API endpoint. But it can be something else. You can have a cron schedule, for example, if you need to do um, if you need to do certain data analysis or data processing every day at a certain time or every week, for example, um, you can also hook up to, cha if, to changes to your databases or your blob storage. And this gives you uh, the ability to couple a lot, a lot of services. Um, we also now have a, a sure functions that allows you to do um, uh, much more complex paradigms. So, for example, if you're familiar with tools like Airflow, where you have a DAG um, that can branch into multiple processes and then find in again or branch in again, um, you can now integrate those kind of approaches and you can couple with uh, many, many services um, for that process using um, durable functions. And also, uh, by definition, and this is something that we have to be very, very careful, is uh, serverless by default is meant to be stateless and short-lived. Um, so whenever you are creating a function or something on serverless, you have to remember that whatever assets you are creating within your runtime environment is ephemeral. So once your, your function gets shut down, uh, that disappears as well. So if there's anything that you need to persist, um, you need to hook up to uh, another service or save it uh, in another way. And also one of the, because all of this is meant to be triggering events and be very, very um, efficient, serverless functions are also meant to be short-lived. So, um, be very careful because in a short functions, you have a, a time span of about uh, 10 to 30 minutes, depending on the plan that you are, if it's a consumption plan or a premium plan. But if you are performing operations that take longer than 30 minutes, let's say, um, you will need to use durable functions so that you can use uh, longer processing time. And again, um, finally, a sure function, uh, function, sorry, serverless functions are meant to be asynchronous, um, meaning that it doesn't ha you don't have to wait for a response for whatever process you're kicking in to kick in and, and be performed. And because of all of these characteristics or before of, of all of these advantages, uh, Functions as a service are really good for image and video processing. Um, if you are doing some sort of um, image capture and video capture and you need to use things like TensorFlow or PyTorch and Keras or whatever, um, functions as a service are very, very convenient because um, you can imagine that it will only be triggered when you add a, a new image, for example, to, to, your, to your storage or a new image is captured. Uh, and because of this, also, if you are working on things like Internet of Things, sure, it, functions as a service are also very suitable, um, especially because you can have multiple sensors, you can be re uh, recording or collecting information from many inputs at different times. Um, but as that information comes in, it can be processed in a storage in a seamless way. And also data pipelines, data processing pipelines are a very, very good case scenario for 
uh, functions as a service um, because of the different paradigms that I meant uh, that I mentioned before, where you can hook up different services. Um, you can create now using dual functions paradigms in which you uh, find in branch in branch out. Um, and can do some sort of, of parallel data processing and, and then send out directly to another database or another data source. Um, so this has all been about um, serverless so far. And um, if you have worked in machine learning or have tried to put machine learning systems in production, um, you're gonna find, is, well, straight away find out that uh, machine learning systems can be very complex, both in their setups and the infrastructure that they need, uh, which also makes uh, putting machine learning in production a non-trivial task. It can be very, very uh, convoluted because of the infrastructure, the setup, but also um, because of the different libraries, packages, uh, and dependencies that we currently use in the world of machine learning. And again, uh, unless you're doing very, very uh, large scale machine learning where your product is embedded in another product that is constantly used all the time by millions of people or hundreds of people, um, your resources usage usage is going to be very variable, meaning that you're going to have um, periods of time in which you'll have a lot of requests, for example, or it's going to be loaded on the compute time and some other is you're going to have long uh, periods of idle compute time. Um, so these uh, machine learning systems are, are very suitable for pay as you go. Uh, to make sure that you're only paying for what you're using in terms of your infrastructure and your compute. So I'm going to move on to a live demo and hopefully everything will run smoothly because uh, demos not always do so. Um, so we're going to be using, I've, uh, we're going to be using TensorFlow. Um, so far, we're, I'm not going to be doing the retraining, but I've used transfer learning to retrain an Inception B3. A model to classify cats and dogs. It is a very simple. Um, it is a very simple machine learning, well, deep learning example. Um, but I want to focus on how do we translate this into a serverless paradigm. And for that, we're going to be creating, or I'm going to be creating a HTTP trigger, a sure function locally. I'm going to show you how to do that using things like VS Code, the sure functions extension. Um, and then I'm going to integrate this uh, TensorFlow model um, that I retrained using transfer learning um, to create predictions based on the HTTP API endpoint. And finally, I'm going to show you how to use, again, the Azure Functions extension to deploy the function to Azure. Um, just as, as is a requirement, uh, you would need, if you wanted to do something similar, and I'm going to share these slides as well as a GitHub repository and some other resources later on um, to follow up. If you wanted to, to do something similar, you would need Python 3, VS Code, uh, Python VS Code extension, and a short code, a functions code extension. And it here. And I'm going to start by creating. Oh, fantastic. So I'm going to start by creating a single directory called ML functions. Oh, I didn't. A change to it and I'm gonna open code here because that's what we're gonna be using for all of the demo and my you're gonna notice that my VS code is very tuned to my liking and that is 
one of the things that I like the most about it because uh, you can make it your own. So you're going to see here on the right hand side that I already have uh, Azure. So I have a few Azure extensions installed that I use very frequently. But in this case, I'm going to be using uh, Azure Functions. I've already logged in. We're going to ignore that because uh, the extension is going to take care of all of that for me. Um, I am logged in with my Azure account. By default, it, if you've logged in before, it's going to persist that. So I don't have to log in again. Um, and now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create, sorry, an Azure Functions project in there. So I'm going to use the folder that I have, use Python, and I'm going to be using Python 3.7. Just waiting for this to load the templates. By default, um, this extension should give you a few templates to pull that in from. But again, as As expected, it's not working. Um, it's taking a bit longer. So let me see what the debugging says. Problems. Okay. So let me see. course, because it is a live demo, it doesn't work. Um, and I don't know why. Okay, so I'm going to jump this forward and I'm going to be using um, the short functions. Uh, CLI, I already have that installed. For some reason, my, I think it is my VS Code that is dying. Um, okay. So, I'm going to try again, and if it doesn't work, oh, there you go. So I'm going to create a classify a function. I'm going to use anonymous. Um, that doesn't matter too much at, um, right now because that is just for, this is for a development purpose. And you're going to see straight away that it creates a virtual environment. You're going to see a big bunch of files here. Um, and probably the most important ones, if I close this, is the house JSON, um, where it indicates the version of the short functions that we are using. Um, we also have a settings JSON file in case you are binding to your databases and other stuff. And by default, it also comes with a requirements file. It's going to create here. Um, the virtual environment, if I go to the uh, to the terminal, you should be able to see the logs um, in output once that is completed. There you go. And it tells you that you have created.
Hello everyone, I think we have we are facing some technical problem and uh, it seems that Tanya has disconnected and uh, there might be some techni technical issues from our side. Hi Shashank, yeah. um, I yeah. think till the time Tanya is back, I was just going through a few comments. So there are no questions as of yet, but there is one comment which says the speaker's headset is very good. So probably we can tell yeah. that to Tanya yeah. if she's back. Sure. And uh, feel free to join Delhi stage on Zulip. So all the speakers that you see today uh, will be present on Delhi uh, stage on Zulip. So you can ask any questions you have regarding the talk and feel free to connect. Just to add one more thing, let's let's wait for a couple of minutes to see if she can uh, we can reach out to her. Well, uh, let's go through something that you can do during the networking session that we have. So there is oh, this okay. break, yeah, and networking session, right? Shashank, I think she's up. We can just add her to stream. Hi, Tanya, oh, are, you, are you up? Yes, StreamYard kicked me out somehow. Oh, OK. Anyway, we and, brought you back in. Let's, let's get And right you wouldn't let me in again until now. So OK, it's fine. OK, you can continue, yeah. Sure. So sorry about that, um, but I've, uh, I don't know what happened. Anyway, I'm going to go super, super quick so I didn't run into the other, um, the other session, but um, you're going to see by default that there are lots of new files that were created in VS Code. And the most important ones, I've already mentioned it, um, but there is a Dunder in a Dunder Pi file. Uh, where we are actually going to be creating, uh, defining the methods and defining our function so that we can use it. Um, I also went ahead while uh, StreamYard was playing with me and imported my labels, uh, my pre-trained model and my predict uh, script. So now what is left is I'm going to modify this um, so I'm going to add JSON and I'm also going to import my helpers uh, my helpers uh, helper script and then you'll notice that the main function uh, is, it, is out of the type of HTTP response, of HTTP request, sorry, uh, because that's uh, the trigger that we created. And I'm going to ask, uh, because we want to do a prediction on an image, I'm going to get the parameters. Uh, from from the request. So when we do a POST request to the API uh, endpoint, we're going to pass a URL from um, from there, whatever we're using. We can use a command line or and I'm going to just get on uh, just going to print out what image we got. And now I'm going to remove all of this because I don't need it. This is quite simple. And I'm going to create a new variable called results uh, where I'm going to call my method And because this is all going to be a HTTP response, I'm going to send some headers. Um, if you're familiar with requests, you're going to recognize that I am 
doing this, so my response can be of type JSON. And I am adding another uh, access control allow origin uh, because I also want to add a front end. And if I don't add that, I can't hook up what my front end with a dash or function. So I have that, I have imported the packages that I need. I have created my main function as, and if everything is successful, I'm not adding any try and catch at the moment. Um, it's going to re return the response. And just to have it here, this is, um, this is a helper function that I have. I'm already using the model and the labels. In this case, I, uh, in this case, I am um, predicting or classifying ducks and cats. And this is a lot, a lot of uh, extra code. Uh, it is a lot of manipulation so that uh, we can use the images and things of the such. All of this is going to be in a repository and you're going to be able to um, to check it. So now, if I go back to a sure function, it seems like this is still not very happy. But I can use F5. And F5 is going to start debug mode. Uh, I'm going to actually put here debug mode so I can uh, start up my Azure function, you're going to see that it's installing a lot of uh, requirements. In this case, it's TensorFlow, Pelo, uh, NumPy, and all of that. Ooh. OK, let me, I don't know why my function is not working. It might be, let me do a five. This is for some reason. Hmm. Um, let me see if I can find oh, I don't know why it's not allowing me to this. I should have this installed unless something horrible happened. Um, let me try again because I was running this demo this morning. And it seems that it definitely doesn't want to work. So let me see if I can run it from here. And I'm going to send a, an image. I'm going to get a, 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 just a random dog image here. Um, pass it. Hmm. And it just doesn't want to run locally, which is a bit annoying. Well, this is not working and it should uh, work. So what I'm going to try and do is deploy directly and see if 
this works. Using 3.7 and I am going to deploy to West Europe. Something must have gone really wrong with uh, uninstalling stuff recently. And you're going to see uh, one of the nice things is that I can just deploy directly from Azure Functions. From VS Code. And if I go to my dashboard, um, if I go to my dashboard on Azure, you're going to see that it's already creating all of this all of these resources that I need. Um, you can see the, the logs out here. And now it's creating the application. So if I go to functions, there we go. Oh, what did I do? I did function app. Uh, it is still being made or being deployed. And you can see here that it is using Python 3.7. Um, and it's doing a lot of uh, sip. Well, it's sipping so that it can deploy all of this. Um, it's collecting and downloading the different packages. I should be able here to see my function app. Let me maximize this a bit. And I can go and look directly. So here, by default, it gives you a, a URL for your function app. And you can see the different activity logs because we've not a, yet created, um, we've not yet created um, any requests or anything. There are no events up there. So let me go back. And this might take a while because it's downloading again and creating the virtual environment here. And I am going to wrap up here because um, I've had so many technical issues this morning. I don't know why, um, but I'm going to be in the upskill booth session um, for the rest of the day. I don't want to take more time off uh, any other any other sessions. And I'm very, very sorry uh, for all of these issues. It sometimes just happens. No problem, Tanya. Thanks a lot. And uh, yes, we, it's completely offline, so we we assume that these things can happen. So we can't do this. We can't do anything about this. So we um, request all your attendees who are watching this session right now to go on Zulip, go to the Delhi stage screen, and all the speakers from the Delhi stage will be present there. So you can have a conversation, ask any questions regarding the talk that you want to. And speakers can also share resources that they were using, the presentations, the code base, or whatever they want to share with the attendees on the Zulip chat. So feel free to go there. And thanks a lot, Tanya. Any closing words? Thank you. Uh, and again, this is what happens uh, when you're trying to do the live demos. I, It's OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> No problem. Thanks a lot, Tanya. Thank you.